Hello, everyone out there in YouTube land. We are super excited to celebrate the back to school season with all of the educators, students, everyone out there who loves spooky stories. And I'm really excited to be joined by my special guest, author Sarah Cannon. Welcome. Hey there. It's good to be here. <laughs> hey. Me, a couple number of spiders. Yeah, show me some spiders. Did you bring your books to show off too? Let's have a look. The spiders don't show off voluntarily. Like they would run across the screen. They would not come over here just because I said yo. <laughs> I actually have a whole like thing prepared of spiders. So if you run out and you need some extras to snack on, you can always get one of these. Oh, um, <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, yeah, I am Sarah Cannon. I'm the author of two books. The first one is Oddity, which is actually set right around back to school time in point of fact, which is something I particularly love about it. And the other is Twist. This one is set in Tulsa, Oklahoma in the 80s, which is where I lived when I was a middle grader and has monsters galore. If you're here for the monsters, you need this book. So I am totally here for the monsters, and we're actually going to be hearing from a number of amazing spooky friends tonight, and they are going to be doing things like showing you how to create a zombie survival kit, making slime, spooky back-to-school snacks, all kinds of fun and amazing things, but I will quickly introduce myself too. So I'm Kim Ventrella, author of several books for middle grade readers. They're all about kids dealing with complicated emotions plus magic. So such as, oh, I'm showing you the back with my little note there, <laughs> such as Skeleton Tree, all about a boy who learns a new perspective on death with the help of a skeleton growing in his backyard. And also Bone Hollow, which is all about what would happen if you were asked to become death with a capital D, like a Grim Reaper type figure, and you were only 12 years old, what would happen? Um, 2020 books include Hello Future Me, about a girl who tries to stop her parents' divorce with the help of her future self, and a new magic shop that pops up in town. And The Secret Life of Sam, about a boy who finds a way to visit his father after he dies. But the problem is the portal to this magical swamp will not stay open for long. So all kinds of fun. And anyone who loves those scary, 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 scary stories, I also have a story in this one, Don't Turn Out the Lights. And this has tales by 35 amazing authors and really haunting illustrations. So definitely yeah, pick and those. is really scary. Like it is. Super scary. It's super scary. So tonight, first of all, because I know the main concern that every student has when they're going back to school is what do I do if the zombie apocalypse breaks out while yeah. I'm there, right? I mean, that's what I was always concerned with. And I always thought you had to buy special supplies. Like you had to go to like the army surplus store and get like really official gear, but it turns out that may not be the case. So we are going to hear from author Brad McClellan, who is going to tell us how we can use everyday items from your regular school supplies to create your very own zombie survival kit. So let's go over to Brad. Hello, spooky readers. My name is Brad McClellan, the author of the Legends of the Lost Causes trilogy. And I'm here today to talk about something very important, something that might just save your life. I'm here to talk about my very own zombie survival kit. Let me introduce you to my assistant, Zoe the zombie. Zoe, why don't you come on out? Zoe? 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 Oh, <laughs> I didn't see you there, Zoe. This is Zoe, everyone, my lovely zombie assistant, and let's get started. So, while you're at school, and a zombie apocalypse breaks out. You might be curious, what can I use to fend off the zombies and survive the apocalypse? Well, let me tell you, everything that you have carried to school will work just perfectly. Let's start with number one, the basic backpack. All right, may look like just a normal backpack, but I promise you, you can carry all sorts of survival gear in this bad boy. And also, if you're wearing it and it happens to come loose while the zombies trying to carry you off, then you'll escape, but the backpack won't. And you can always get a new backpack. And also, the zombie can wear it. The second thing, 
is a trusty ruler. You may have seen a ruler before. However, this is not just a ruler. This is a survival tool. And let me tell you how you're gonna use it. What a zombie likes to do is get in really close and try to eat your brains, right? That's kind of what a zombie's supposed to do. But if you hold that ruler out between your brain and the zombie's mouth, that's gonna give you the exact distance that you're gonna need in order to stay safe and your brain from getting eaten. So that's approximately, what, 12 inches away from Zoe's mouth. So I think that we're probably good at this point unless Zoe eats the entire ruler and comes after my brains. At which point, you can use number three. glue and here's what glue can do it doesn't just work on just regular paper during a zombie apocalypse the glue is probably going to be one of your most precious items let me show you what it'll do zoe come zoe come over here come over here zoe sorry sorry zoe's trying to get away so what you do is you just like glue zoe's mouth just glue those teeth and then you just like yeah get in there get, just like that and then you basically have to hold the zombie's mouth closed until the glue solidified. Oh, I think I may, I may have just gotten bitten. It's okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Zoe, thank you for your assistance. Uh, that brings me to my next item is snacks. Everybody loves snacks, Zoe loves snacks. I'm not gonna put my finger there. So anyway, what you wanna do is you wanna have healthy snacks on you. And what they call fruit and veggies, what your mom always calls fruit and veggies, brain food, right? Like this, like this little simple apple. This is brain food. Well, why not tease the zombie with brain food instead of your own brains? Like this. Okay. Next, we want to go to something a little, a little bit more tech savvy. So let's try, but you didn't know you could use this during the zombie apocalypse, the trusty calculator. Now what this calculator can do is stupefy the zombie and make the zombie wonder, am I actually good at math? So what you do is you type in a little, a little equation, cosine, tangent, and then you just hand it over to the zombie and see if they can work that, that out. Zoe will demonstrate how a zombie works out a complex equation on, on a calculator. And at this point, you can then run away while they are stupefied by the calculator. Last but not least, if none of these items work, you have but one thing in your treasury of items that you will be able to use, and that is, of course, your gym shoes. You're gonna need some really good gym shoes, some excellent jogging shoes to survive the zombie apocalypse at school so that you can slip these bad boys on and you can just go for a hike through the woods up into the mountains, get to a water source, be safe. So Zoe now has the shoes, so I don't have them and I won't be able to run away because I'm barefooted right now, but you get the idea. So I hope that this video is an excellent demonstration of how you can survive a zombie apocalypse at school and I believe I might be turning into a zombie as we speak because I was bitten by Zoe. <sighs> Later. Psst, hey, one more thing. Don't forget to buy my books. Legends of the Lost Causes, book one. Legends of the Lost Causes, book two, The Fang of Bonfire Crossing. And Legends of the Lost Causes, book three the key of Skeleton Peak. Okay, peace out. Oh, excuse me. Hello, welcome back. That, those are some pretty amazing tips. Would you have ever thought to use a calculator that way? No, but I will say I was sitting here with one of my writing notebooks and I have one of my zombie preparedness <gasps> tips on there, which is an apple a day will keep anyone away if you throw it hard enough. It did not occur to me it was brain food, but yes, I agree mm -hmm. that apples are a good zombie defense tactic. And also, I would take the backpack and turn it upside down and put it over the zombie's head, you know? I mean, there you go. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, there's so many, so many great tips I never thought of. So love, love that one. I hope everyone feels a little bit safer going into this school year, knowing all of that. <laughs> Phew. So what about you, Sarah? Are you ready for this? scary school year. What about this Halloween? Do you have any plans? 
I can't wait. I can't wait because <laughs> I live in a creepy little neighborhood in Indianapolis that was named for Washington Irving. And we have an awesome Halloween festival every year. Like we are the only festival in the country that gets to shut down an interstate highway. I'm not even kidding. And the costumes are bananas and like people paint, like there's like window painting and sidewalk chalk contests and there's like so much food. And yeah, I just, Ooh, I can't wait. Awesome. They go hard here decorating for Halloween. Like <laughs> there's just lacking off. I love that. Well, I definitely need to come and visit because I do love the spooky, the eerie. And do you know who else loves those spooky things? It's our good friend, author Angie Smybert. So we're going to learn, actually hear a very ghostly reading from Angie's latest book called The Truth. And if anyone is a fan, especially of ghost dogs, then you might enjoy this one. Here we go. Hi y'all, I'm Angie Smybert. Welcome to a little read along of a scary bit, no spoilers though, of my latest novel, The Truce. In this scene, Bone and her friends are on a stakeout. They're waiting in the woods late at night to see what happens after the last train leaves. Did I mention they're investigating a body found in the mine? The coal train chugged east toward the port in Norfolk and the war. The tipple shut down. Bone elbowed the others awake. No truck appeared. Nothing happened for several long minutes. The barn owl screeched again. Then a large black dog the size of a yearling walked out of the shadow. The dog stood directly under the tip ball. Its big saucer eyes glinted in the moonlight and fixed themselves on bum. One of the boys gulped hard and someone whimpered. Bone stood up. She'd never seen a dog like that, black, muscular, with pointy ears. Was it like the dogs she'd seen in the tag? The others rose behind her. She took a step toward the dog, and it vanished. Ruby gasped. I really am going to pee myself now, Clay whispered. It was a ghost dog, Bone marveled. A real-life spirit dog, just like in Uncle Ash's story. Uncle Ash always said spirit dogs could come as a warning, a harbinger of death, or a bringer of justice. Bone had the distinct feeling that the dog was trying to tell her something. Whoever Will found in Shaft 27 had gotten himself killed right where we're standing, Bone declared. No one argued with her. A real life devil dog was guarding the spot. Well, thanks for listening, y'all, and please pick a, up a copy of The Truths at your local bookstore or library. Now, I'd like you to meet my own real-life double dog, Hubble. Love it! Although, I don't know if I would, like, categorize Hubble as a devil dog. He looks like he might be kind of a nice guy. <laughs> he does. I mean, maybe there was a little glint in his eye. I don't know, but that was pretty cool. So have you ever seen a ghost dog, Sarah? No, but I absolutely love stories about ghostly animals. And I've been like That's trying right. to track down ghost stories I read as a kid, like Ooh, books that aren't yes. in print anymore that have my favorites. Yeah. Yes, there's some really, really good ones. One of my favorites is called Bone Dog, and I'll have to look up the author during one of the breaks. But Bone Dog, it's a picture book. It's so good, except you'll cry at the end. So if you love this type of stories, and there's a scene with dancing skeletons, it's set at Halloween. So it's really a perfect book for this time of year. I'm a little bit offended that even ghost dog books make you cry at the end. We already know that any <laughs> book with a living dog on the cover is going to make it you does, cry. It does. Well, especially, especially the ghost. But it's one of those like really good cries. Like you're so happy, but you're just like so, <laughs> you're so, you're so sad. Oh. But yeah, it's so good. <laughs> so wow. definitely check out. 
bone dog. But speaking of spirits, we have another one of our author friends, S.A. Larson, who actually has her own set of tips for people who are interested in tracking spirits. So this is going to be interesting. I don't know if it's all Ghostbuster. We'll find out. <laughs> Let's take a look. Want a pinky promise? Want a pinky promise? I will be diligent and courageous. Hope you enjoyed this rendition of the 10 etiquettes of the art of spirit tracking, which will be found in my next book. And if you want to find out more, just check out my website. Bye. <laughs> that was pretty epic. Yeah, and we definitely are having like this through line of dogs tonight, it seems. <laughs> We do. We do. I mean, wow. I'm just really sad that my dog, Hera, doesn't get to star in a video tonight. I know. But there was a ghost dog on the slide. Did you see it? Well, there's oh, there should always be a ghost dog. That's all I have to say. Like, they should always ghost dogs everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so much fun. Well, I know that, Sarah, you also have prepared a special thing for us tonight. Do you want to give us a little preface to it? Yeah, I I, I do have two, two tips that I'll give you after you see my video. I did a video because it's a little easier for me to show on camera, um, but also just like the weather is going to get colder. I know it doesn't feel like right now, but it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's time to do stuff. Like if you're very like vampire prone, it's time to plant your garlic, you know, and just some things mm -hmm. like that. It's just important to be prepared for the next season. It's true. Although I will give a tip to people out there who might be like me. If you are a vampire, you might want to skip that part. I mean, garlic. don't, yeah, don't do the garlic, but <laughs> all right, well, let's take a look at this spooky crab. All right, spookies, it's craft time. So here's the situation. As impossible as it seems right now in mid-August, it is going to get cold and it's going to get cold soon. And there is nothing worse than sneaking out of your house for evening shenanigans in the dark and discovering that it's cold outside. Because let's face it, some of us have substandard pockets. So today I'm gonna to show you how to make something that should go in your emergency preparedness backpack that we talked about last time. Ready? Okay, so we are going to make a set of hand warmers and you can throw these in the microwave and then throw them in your coat pockets when you go out. So what you're going to need is you're going to need four squares of fabric. Um, flannel is best or cotton. It has to be something that's natural so that it does not melt when you put it in the microwave. If you have an old flannel shirt or you find a cheap one at a thrift store, that's probably the fastest, easiest way to get your flannel. And I hear you saying, but I'm going to be outside at night sneaking around. Shouldn't I have something that is black? And like maybe, and also if you drop it outside and it's black, you are never, never going to find it again. So 
for frame of reference, if you want to see how big these are, here's the cover of my latest book, Twist, and you can see that they kind of take up about half of that cover. So that's a good size right there. Okay, so we're going to use embroidery floss, which I mentioned to you last time. It makes a nice strong stitch, and then uh, I also use a needle with a pretty big eye so that I can definitely thread it because that's something that can be tricky for newer sewers to do. I apologize for the band-aid in the shot, but sometimes spooky authors do spooky things and get spooky cuts on their fingers, and we're just not going to discuss that right now because we don't have time. So you're going to put a double knot in the end of your floss, and you're going to thread your needle. And the nice thing about flannel is you probably don't need to pin it to hold it steady because it kind of already sticks to itself. But you can use pins, or if pins freak you out, you can use uh, paper clips like we've talked about before. And what you're going to do is you're going to sew along three sides of this and part of the fourth. And I'm going to suggest to you that you do backstitch. And if you've forgotten what backstitching is, that's where you come up through the fabric, you go down like this, and then you come up halfway through the stitch like that. And the reason you're doing that is to create a really firm border with no holes. And the reason you want no holes is because you are going to fill this up with a substance that will hold heat, which in this case is just plain old white rice. Okay, so you can see how if your stitches are not close together, the rice is going to start leaking out the sides, which is going to leave a trail. It could attract rice eating spooky creatures. I mean, there's just any number of things that could go wrong. So backstitch. So now I have sewn along three sides of it. You can see stitching here and along here and here. And I've just left like a little pocket on the fourth side. That's the only part right there that's not sewn in. So I'm going to go ahead now and I'm going to turn this right side out, which is probably going to take a minute and a little bit of doing. So hold tight. Okay, so I've put a funnel made out of paper into my hole in my bean, my hand warmer bean bag. And if you have like a plastic funnel, it's fine to use that, but some people don't. So I just wanted to make sure that you know that you don't have to have any special tools to get this done. So I've got like a little cup of rice here. And I can pour it into the funnel and kind of shake it down and it goes in the bean bag and you're going to keep doing this until it has, you know, a little bit of give. You don't want it crammed tight, tight, tight. And then at that point, all that's left to do is to tuck in the sides of your little pocket like that until it looks kind of like the rest. And you just sew it right along there from the outside, back stitch right across there. And then that's it. You're done. You make two of those. You've got one for each pocket. Yes, we're going to need those. Yeah, for sure. So I do have two tips about this. And you can kind of see now, you can see that I stitch it. It's not pretty. It doesn't have to be pretty. Cute is only good as a decoy when you are out there doing spooky things. Your hand warmers <laughs> don't have to be cute, but they can be. But two things. One is that this makes a really awesome cat toy, whether you want it to or not. So like maybe put it somewhere that your cats can't get it or they're going to chuck it around, which is fun to watch. But I'm just saying. The other is I hear you saying right now, yeah, but I have a younger sibling who likes to follow me around. I try to sneak out of the house in the middle of the night and then they want to come with me and I'm not making them a set. That's fine. <laughs> but if they're making their own set, you want to give them something bigger to put inside it because their stitches are going to be bigger because they're little and they're just learning. So you could do like feed corn if you're the kind of person who lives on a farm or knows people who has animals. Um, if that doesn't work, because like this comes in 25 pound bags, you guys, you don't need a 25 pound bag. So if that won't work, then go to like the international aisle in your grocery store or go to a bodega and you can find corn that's used for cooking, like hominy corn that's big. Um, and that will work in your hand warmer as well, but it's bigger so you can have some messed up stitches and it still won't fall out. Make sense? I love it. I feel like I'm ready for winter now, almost. First, we have to do Halloween. <laughs> yes. We'll see, but these can be useful for Halloween. Like if you're out trick-or-treating, you're not going to like go back in the house before you get to the house with the full-size candy bars. No way. You're going to keep on trucking. So you'll need these. Yeah, we're going to need our pocket warmers. Well, I did remember the author of the book I mentioned, Bone Dog. It's Eric Roman. So if anybody wants to go to their library and check that one out, it's a great Halloween story. But Sarah, I'm wondering, do you have any favorite Halloween books 
or things that are maybe set around Halloween? You know, I have a few that I really, well, you know, of course it's like tradition to read certain books in our family. So we always have one that we read called Too Many Pumpkins and it's not really spooky, but like if you enjoy pumpkins, you'll pumpkins, enjoy it. Um, yes, our course. family likes Coraline, um, which is yes. like a really spooky yes. story, but we kind of love it. Because the hand is the best, right? <laughs> and the button eyes for some reason. Yes. And actually you'll notice this, like if you read Oddity, one of the evil puppets that runs the town in Oddity is like a ragdoll puppet and she has button <laughs> eyes. And that's part of why, because I still lose sleep over the button eyes and Coraline if you handle it. Um, so okay. that's really popular at our house as well. And growing up, I don't know if you ever read Shel Silverstein, but there was that poem called I'm Reginald Clark, I'm Afraid of the Dark. Oh, and I don't remember. I'm going to look it up. It's it this bit stalling for bedtime, basically. But at the very end of it, it says, I'm Reginald Clark. I'm afraid of the dark. So please do not shut this book on me. And my mom would like slam the book shut and we'd all scream. So that was always a big deal as well. Oh, man. I hate it when you get smushed inside a book, right? No. Jeez. The worst. <laughs> well, and you as Especially don't want to get smushed inside a book if you have the witchy fingers that we're about to learn about <laughs> from one of our favorite authors, Cynthia Regg. Although these particular witchy fingers can also be quite delicious. So we're going to learn about a very spooky snack that you can make after school. Let's turn it over to Cynthia. Hi. Cynthia Reck here, author of From the Grave and Into the Shadowlands. And in my monster world, there are lots of yummy and strange food. So today I'm going to show you a super simple after school spooky snack using some baby carrots and a little bit of ranch dressing or cream cheese works really well too. I just didn't happen to have that today some sliced almonds, and I like toasted sliced almonds, and I've got our witchy fingers stuck in some peanut butter today, clawing their way out, but guacamole is a really good option as well. So here's how you do it. Dip your baby carrot into your cream cheese or your dressing, stick on your fingernail, and there you go. You have got a six-fingered witchy hand clawing its way out of the peanut butter. Yum. Enjoy. Bye-bye. <laughs> I mean, I know. I don't know about anyone else, but I'm always craving some kind of fingers when it comes around Halloween time. Usually it's zombie fingers, but I can do witch fingers. Yeah, no, witch fingers, I think, are, are seasonal. They're kind of like a pumpkin spice latte. Like, there's there's a time of year that witch fingers are most uh, festive. So. They are. They are. And especially, you know, if you dip them in your pumpkin spice latte. Oh, yeah. Just get a little foam there on that go. fingernail. It's With your perfect. ranch dressing. That would be <laughs> With your crazy. ranch dressing. It is delightful. Delightful. <laughs> <laughs> so it's fun things from us kids like <laughs> i know i know and it's almost as tasty as eating your own slime would be but we don't recommend you eat this slime this one is to play with and we're going to go to our very own janet fox and she's going to show us her recipe for slime and we will see how that works out <laughs> hi everyone Today, I'm going to show you how to make easy slime in your own kitchen. First things first, always use safety precautions when you are doing any kind of experimental work. This means protective glasses, yes, and protective gear. Next. All you need for this little slimy experiment is cornstarch and shampoo. Half a cup of shampoo and a quarter of a cup of cornstarch. And we're going to mix these together. Now 
Next, we're going to add a tablespoon of water and mix that in. Then we're going to add one at a time and very slowly, five more tablespoons of water. Hmm. Doesn't look much like slime. Looks more like kind of, uh, I don't know. Hmm. But it smells nice. Shampoo smells really nice. And this, boys and girls, is why I'm a writer and not a chemist. Still turning it. Oh my god. <laughs> so I don't know, have you ever made slime, Sarah? I have, I have, but when I make it, I usually make it out of um, Elmer's glue and there's this stuff called liquid starch. And it mm. makes like a very springy slime when you mix it together, which I like. I like it to be like that kind of tactile, squishy. Me too. Me too. <laughs> yes, I also, because I used to work at the library and we get those industrial sized things of Elmer's glue. So Elmer's glue, baking soda, and I think that was all I put in and then dye. Although I've seen some of the recipes call for contact solutions. So you can Google this online. But yeah, the Elmer's glue based ones will really make you some like, you know, of the yeah. consistency you're thinking. Although I heard last year that slime was so popular that there was like an Elmer's glue shortage for a while because oh people God. were doing so much slime. I guess they were stuck at home and they were just yeah. busy making slime, so. You know what would be fun would be to see if there's a recipe that uses craft paint because there's some craft paint that glows in the dark. And it would be yes. so much fun to make glow with the dark slime. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I think, yeah, I think we've done that before because one thing we would do at the library, we would have these big events where you kind of walk through different areas and in the closet, we would make it the glow in the dark room because it could be so dark in there. And so they go through and I'm pretty sure glow in the dark slime or glow in the dark Play-Doh or maybe both we had in there. So definitely look those up online. I'm pretty sure <laughs> they um, are a thing. I have some little slimes. I went and got boba tea earlier and I don't know if you can see them on camera. But like, I see the see little green. Signs. Yeah. And I love them. They're like a kind of jelly. They're called grass jelly and they're really yummy. Ooh. But I like to pretend that they're like ectoplasm or they're just so satisfying. <laughs> They are delicious looking. I love them. And we are actually just about out of time. But before we finish up our back to school bash, I wanted to ask you, Sarah, our special guest, one final question. <laughs> so what are you most looking forward to this Halloween season? Is it a special book? Or I know you have the big parade. Is it a special costume? Anything specific that you're really excited about? Well, I'll tell you what. I'm one of those people who used to have a bunch of middle grade kids in my house, and I don't anymore. Two of them are off at college, and I only have one left oh. at home. And he and I have decided that the Halloween decorations at our house this year have to be like epic and so that I'm really going to throw my energy into like the two of us being this dastardly duo that make this especially spooky house. So I love it. That sounds amazing. Very excited for that. Well, I might decorate myself. Of course, this is my natural hair, but I also have some cool wigs that I might put on and just dress up and do some fun live streams. So that will be great. <laughs> and also so many spooky reads, I think, um, will be happening. So I know one of them that I'm really excited about from one of our author friends, Josh Allen has a collection uh -huh. coming out of short stories called Only If You Dare. And we were talking about glow in the dark things. The cover of that book actually glows in the dark. So yes, and it's going to be really good. It's going to be epic because everybody that reads it is freaking out. Like they're all just like making witch fingers at everybody. So It's true. And I actually got to read an early copy so I can attest they're really good. So if you especially love to see the like spooky side of ordinary objects, like things that you wouldn't think would be scary, but they are, then you should definitely, definitely read that book. Yes, for sure. And if you haven't caught um, Long Lost yet, I <gasps> so just finished this one. This is another one of our spooky authors. It was so, 
satisfying. And doesn't Ellie Malinay go have a new book out this week? Ghost Girl. And if you yeah. want to learn more about Ghost Girl, that one just came out and we just did an interview with Ali yesterday. So you can find that on our spooky YouTube channel. And definitely if you haven't already subscribed, go hit that subscribe button to see all of our fun upcoming videos. And another book that I'm really looking forward to, I actually haven't read yet, even though the second one's about to come out, is The Stitchers by Lori and Lawrence, and that is our book club selection for August. So on August 24th, join us live. We'll be talking with Lorian. You can get your questions in the chat, and she'll be talking book one and probably, maybe, I don't know, maybe she'll give us some hints about book two, which is getting ready to come out. So yeah, so that is going to be really exciting. And if we have any teachers out there, I do want to remind everyone to head over to SpookyMiddleGrade.com, scrolling at the bottom, because we are just now scheduling our free author visits for schools. And you will see not two authors on your screen, but actually four. <laughs> and your students Great. will get to ask all their burning questions about writing, publishing, do we believe in ghosts? Whatever questions they have, and we will answer them, and those are absolutely free. So head on down there to check that out. And Sarah, do you want to leave people with any kind of spooky wishes for the season? Yeah, I just want to be like really clear that if you think you hear scratching on your window, you totally do. So um, <laughs> this is a really good season to get those blankets back on your bed so that you can pull them up over your head when you're reading all of our spooky books and when you hear that scratching, tapping noise. And also just remember that like bats are creepy, but they're also our friends and pollinators. So wave when you see them. Bats if and spiders. You, yes. yeah. Yes, absolutely. We love it. Well, thanks so much to everyone who joined us and thanks to my special guest, Sarah Cannon. And I'm going to let our little promo for our next month's book club play us out. So if you need to write any info down, jot that down now. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great night.